Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we'll provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. India exposes Pakistan's terror nexus at UN calls for global action. Baloch resistance strikes back as oppression by Pakistan and China faces growing rebellion. And Pakistan launches brutal crackdown on Pashtun movement ahead of Jirga. India has once again taken a strong stand against Pakistan's state-sponsored terrorism on the global stage. At the United Nations General Assembly session on Friday, India slammed Islamabad over its continued support for international terrorism, highlighting the dangerous consequences of state-backed extremism. From the 2008 Mumbai attacks to the Pulwama incident, India's representative highlighted the country's long struggle against terrorism fueled by its neighbour. Here's more on the story. India's message at the 77th session of the UN General Assembly was clear and unequivocal. During a session on eliminating international terrorism, India's representative highlighted the horrors India has endured due to terrorism backed by its neighbor Pakistan. The Indian diplomat, in a veiled but sharp reference to Pakistan, recounted major terror attacks in India the deadly 2008 Mumbai attacks that claimed over 160 lives, the 2016 Pathan Court Air Base attack and the 2019 Pulwama suicide bombing that killed 40 Indian soldiers. She accused Pakistan of sponsoring and harboring terrorist groups, including those responsible for these attacks, stating that Pakistan's support for terrorism is a well-documented and deliberate strategy. India has faced the horrors of state-sponsored cross-border terrorism much prior to the world taking serious note of it. Over the last more than three decades, we have lost thousands of innocent civilian lives. The 2008 Mumbai terror attacks, the 2016 Patankot air base attack, and the 2019 suicide bombing of a policeman at Pulwama are imprinted strongly in every Indian's living memory. We have and will continue to fight terrorism resolutely, bravely, and with a zero-tolerance approach. India's statement took aim at Pakistan's use of terror groups such as Lashkar-e-Taiba and jaish e mohammad which continue to operate freely from Pakistani soil. The diplomat further warned that countries supporting or turning a blind eye to such extremist networks are playing with fire. In a scathing rebuke, she called out Pakistan for making terrorism a key component of its foreign policy, fueling instability in the region. The Indian diplomat said it was ironic that Pakistan continues to claim victimhood from terrorism while openly celebrating the mastermind of global terrorism. India underscored that Pakistan's leadership has consistently glorified terrorists, providing a breeding ground for extremism to flourish, not just within its borders, but across the region. It is unfortunate that some amongst us, motivated by their narrow political agendas, look for reasons to justify terrorism. Be because of these states, the global resolve to fight against terrorism gets diminished. Because of such states, even 15 years after the Mumbai terror attacks, the masterminds continue to roam scot-free with full state hospitality. Not only do such states justify terrorism, their governments and their agencies have made terrorism their state policy. Moreover, in order to deflect the attention of the international community from their nefarious agendas, such states attempt to portray themselves as victims of terrorism. India's strong stance at the UN meeting has once again brought global attention to Pakistan's role in fostering terrorism. The international community is increasingly being called upon to hold Pakistan accountable 
for its continued support for extremist groups. New Delhi has consistently pushed for greater international cooperation in identifying and sanctioning countries that sponsor terrorism, advocating for the adoption of a zero-tolerance policy. In a critical escalation of state repression, Pakistan launched an aggressive crackdown against the Pashtun Tahafuz movement ahead of the historic Pashtun National Jirga organized on October 11, 2024. The Jirga, a traditional Pashtun assembly, aimed to address decades of injustice and human rights violations endured by the Pashtun people. However, the Pakistani state, fearing the movement's growing unity, responded with brutal tactics to sabotage the peaceful gathering. In an all-too-familiar pattern, Pakistan's military began using heavy-handed tactics to suppress political movements, this time targeting the grassroots campaign of the PTM. The Pashtun Tahafuz movement, which has long campaigned against extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances and the systematic repression of the Pashtun community now faces one of its most serious challenges as the Pakistani state intensifies its violent efforts to stifle dissent. Over the past few weeks, intelligence agencies and security forces have repeatedly attacked PDM volunteers preparing for the Pashtun National Court, a historic assembly aimed at addressing the grievances of Pashtun people. Tents have been burnt, supplies stolen and unarmed civilians fired upon by security forces in the dead of night. Despite the violence, PDM volunteers remain resolute in their determination to hold this critical assembly. The PTM has long called for accountability for the state's actions in Pashtun territories, including land grabs by the military, human rights abuses and the use of Pashtun lands for proxy wars. However, Pakistan's establishment views the Jirga as a direct threat to its control over the region and its strategic interests in Afghanistan. In a recent speech, PDM leader Manzoor Pashtin condemned the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa police for siding with the oppressors rather than their own people. Zulam Jabar de Kalaidai, Sal Kanununa, Sal Dafe, Sal Khabare, Sal Zulmuna Waka, Hobiaba Hamiwa Jawapta Tamkigi, or the Pokhtunu Jawabas, the Pokhtunu Sap Kitaba San Nadai, Pokhtun Dakpal Ror Saraham. Sadai Sab Kitab Naka Yudir Wazir Kavi, Pakhtun Pahid Shik, Pahar Shik Rekam Zurikavi, Kupatari Kapotun Payasab Kitab Kichata Senedi Prefodili. Pakistan's Minister of Information recently made baseless claims that PDM has ties to terrorist groups, though no credible evidence has been presented. The PTM, founded in 2014, has become a potent symbol of resistance against Pakistan's deep-rooted discrimination against the Pashtun people. The Pakistani state's crackdown is not just limited to the disruption of the Jirga. Across Pashtun territories, markets, homes and even mosques have been destroyed by state forces in what many see as a calculated effort to subdue Pashtun aspirations for self-determination. Pashtun leaders have argued that their land, rich in natural resources, has been used as a pawn in proxy wars, especially in the context of Afghanistan, where Pakistan continues to meddle in regional conflicts. In response to state repression and recent crackdown on protesters, PTM activists held protests outside the Pakistani embassy in London raising international awareness about the plight of the Pashtun people. We the protesters stand united in condemning the brutal and escalating violence by Pakistan state security forces against the Pashtun nation. The recent assassination attempts on Manzoor Pashtun, the leader of Pashtun Tahapur's movement, and the violent crackdown and the Pashtun National Jirga organizers are direct attack on truth, justice, and human dignity. These actions signal a full-scale assault 
on the fundamental rights of the Pashtun nation. We will not remain silent in the face of such operation. We demand an immediate end to Pakistan's state-sponsored terrorism against Pashtun. Manzoor Pashtin, a peaceful advocate for the basic human rights of Pashtun, has become the target of state-sponsored assassination plots. These are coordinated efforts to silence a voice that represents millions of marginalized Pashtun. The Pakistani establishment sphere of a united Pashtun front is palpable. The Jirga marks the first time in years that Pashtun leaders from across the region, from Swat to Chaman, have come together in an unprecedented show of solidarity. The state's aggressive crackdown is a clear indication of its unwillingness to tolerate any movement that challenges its grip on power. As Pakistani security forces continue to target PTM leaders, including Manzoor Pashtin, the movement's calls for justice are growing louder. With growing international concern over Pakistan's human rights record, the repression of the PTM could further isolate Islamabad on the world stage. Tensions are boiling in Pakistan's volatile southwestern region of Balochistan as insurgent groups intensify their campaign against Islamabad and its ally China. A deadly explosion near Karachi's international airport claimed the lives of three individuals, including two Chinese nationals, in an attack that is the latest reminder of the Balochistan insurgency's growing resistance to Pakistan's control and China's expanding influence. We have a report. On October 6, a massive explosion occurred near the international airport of the southern Pakistani city of Karachi, killing a total of three persons and injuring at least 17 others. Footage of the scene of the explosion showed several vehicles engulfed in flames. The attack is the latest in a string of violence against Chinese workers in Pakistan. It comes less than two weeks before the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit to be held in the national capital. In a statement, the Chinese embassy in Pakistan confirmed that two Chinese nationals were killed and one injured in the explosion near the airport. The Baloch Liberation Army, or BLA, an armed rebel group operating in the region, took responsibility for the carnage. Baloch Liberation Army claimed the explosion was an attack carried out by them using a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device targeting Chinese nationals, including engineers. It was a well-coordinated attack by the Baloch Liberation Army, which uh, targeted Chinese nationals at a place which is highly secure area at a time when Chinese nationals were highly secured and uh, they were going in, you know, along with the military convoy. The convoy was uh, over like 15 to 16 military vehicles, but still the Baloch Liberation Army's Majid Brigade uh, not only uh, had that information, but they were able to attack and target Chinese nationals. And this attack was not an isolated attack. The Baloch Liberation Army has already given ultimatum to the Chinese government that they should leave Balochistan, they should stop supporting Pakistan, they should stop funding Pakistan, they should... The Baloch Liberation Army has been fighting for the independence of Balochistan, a region that has long suffered under the control of both Pakistan and increasingly China. The insurgency has intensified in recent years, particularly as Beijing expands its economic presence in the region through large-scale infrastructure projects like CPEC. In August, the BLA launched coordinated attacks in Balochistan, resulting in over 70 deaths. The group's opposition to China stems from a deep-rooted belief that Chinese investment is exacerbating the plight of the Baloch people. 
by exploiting their natural resources while delivering little to no benefits to local communities. The BLA's origins can be traced back to the 1970s when leftist guerrilla groups in Balochistan fought for autonomy. Their movement was brutally crushed by the Pakistani military, but the group has since re-emerged and today it wages larger scale attacks, particularly targeting Chinese workers and interests. Recently, where Baloch Liberation Army has taken over the much city, they have taken over the city for over two days and they've killed a huge number of Pakistani military personnel and they have targeted many, you know, uh, military installments and other uh, governmental installments there. Uh, after that, what we have seen only in the month of August, when the Operation Herof, in which, uh, you know, Mahal Baloch, a female suicide attacker, was also involved. Along with her, there was uh, uh, 10 suicide attackers and a huge number of Baloch Liberation Army's members taken part. According to the organization, the number was in 800. So think about it. If Baloch Liberation Army is capable of attacking Pakistan at the very same day in 14, 40 districts of Balochistan, sorry, 14 districts of Balochistan uh, in 40 uh, different areas, and they can carry out 44 attacks, and all those attacks are lethal. Despite promises of economic development, Balochistan remains mired in poverty and underdevelopment. Nearly 70% of the population lives below the poverty line, with a staggering number of children out of school. Healthcare and education systems in the region are on the verge of collapse, leading to a worsening humanitarian situation. Chinese projects in Gwadar, once a hub for the indigenous Baloch people, have displaced local businesses and residents further alienating the local population. This influx of Chinese interests has deepened Pakistan's already crippling debt to Beijing, leaving little room for Balochistan's economic upliftment. For many in Balochistan, China's growing influence represents a form of neo-colonialism where the Baloch land and resources are exploited while the people continue to face grinding poverty. There is a huge resentment in the Baloch people. They are they are continuously resisting. Uh, if you see if in Balochistan, no one is happy that the Chinese are present in Balochistan. No one is happy that the, how they are fencing Gwadar, how they are treating the locals of Gwadar, how they are treating the locals of the area from where they say that they're investing billions of dollars, the people of that area does not have drinking water. The absence of a political solution has driven the Baloch people to take up arms against both Pakistan and China. With no meaningful dialogue or efforts to address the underlying grievances, Baloch groups have resorted to armed resistance, seeing no other path to achieve autonomy or independence. As Pakistan grapples with its foundational ideals, the gap between promise and reality has never been wider. Initially conceived as a safe haven for Muslims, the nation now faces a myriad of challenges including widespread human rights violations and political instability. Recent events, such as the conference hosted by the Asian Human Rights Forum in the British Parliament, have brought these issues to the forefront, emphasizing the plight of religious minorities and the erosion of democratic institutions. Take a look. The creation of Pakistan in 1947 was premised on the misguided notion of establishing a homeland for Muslims, fueled by an unfounded fear of marginalization in a predominantly Hindu India. However, what began as a promise of safety quickly morphed into a nightmare for religious minorities. The false promises of coexistence rapidly faded as political leaders began to exploit sectarian sentiments to rally support and distract from pressing socio-economic issues. 
The current state of Pakistan is now visible to the entire world, revealing the myriad challenges and struggles the nation faces. From escalating human rights violations to economic instability, the realities on the ground are increasingly hard to ignore. Recently, the Asian Human Rights Forum hosted a conference in the House of Commons in the British Parliament to discuss the severe human rights violations occurring in Pakistan. Attendees of the conference received a comprehensive 28-page booklet that meticulously detailed the human rights violations occurring in Pakistan. The event featured several notable figures and was moderated by Arif Ajakia, a human rights defender and executive director of the Asian Human Rights Forum. He emphasized that throughout history, no country established on the basis of religion has avoided significant repercussions. I was born in Pakistan and uh, raised in Pakistan, but uh, what Pakistan has become today is a jail for its ethnic, religious and sectarian minorities. And we are raising human rights violations issues in, uh, in Pakistan, uh, be it Sindh, which is my motherland, uh, Balochistan, KP. Uh, the creation of Pakistan, I think it was done in this building. Pakistan, a new country was created on the lines of religion. It was the first country in the history of world created on the name of religion. During the partition of British India in 1947, the All India Muslim League, led by figures like Muhammad Ali Jinnah, made numerous promises to garner support from various regions, including Sindh and Balochistan. The League portrayed the creation of Pakistan as a solution to the political and economic marginalization faced by Muslims in these provinces. Leaders promised that a separate state would ensure their rights cultural identity and economic prosperity. However, these assurances quickly proved to be hollow. In the years following its inception in 1947, Pakistan experienced a series of political upheavals and power struggles, which led to the military stepping in time and again, effectively sidelining democratic institutions. The army, citing instability and national security concerns, took control of the government under the guise of restoring order, resulting in prolonged periods of martial law. In the 1940 resolution of All India Muslim League, <clears throat> what Pakistan was not used, it was mentioned that there will be independent states, plural, states in northwest of British India. And on that promise, uh, Sindh, uh, supported movement of Pakistan. But uh, father of Sindh nation, Sain G.M. Sayed, who supported Pakistan nation on this promise that Sindh will be an independent state. But after the independence, Pakistan was taken over by Pakistan's army, continuous martial laws, and uh, we never saw a democracy in Pakistan. As the international community continues to shed light on the pressing human rights issues in Pakistan, it is imperative for the global audience to acknowledge the ongoing struggle of its citizens. Human rights violations, including the persecution of religious minorities, suppression of free speech and arbitrary detentions, are not merely localized issues. They resonate with universal principles of dignity and justice that the world must uphold. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.